I know you know, today we're commemorating, we're celebrating Palm Sunday. Do you remember what happened on Palm Sunday? Do you remember that, that the king came and uh, as it was prophesied in the scripture, he was up on the top of the Mount of Olives and there were multitudes that were gathered uh, on that whole holy hill and they were, do you know what they were doing? They were declaring, they were praising, they were singing, they were excited. Um, it was so raucous, it was so celebratory, it was so vibrant, it was so filled with joy that the Pharisees and scribes said to Jesus, hey, you know, tell, tell these disciples to pipe down because we don't like all the noise they're making. And Jesus said, even if they are silent, yeah, that's right. You guys actually quoted that verse better than the first service. It was like, they were, it was all over the map. Um, so I'm just saying to you, hey, hey, we come on Palm Sunday and we want to be in alignment, in conjunction with that holy praise that was dedicated to our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. We want to be that celebratory. Every Sunday morning, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ we have the opportunity to give him praise and to give him praise with our whole heart, right? I mean, I'm talking about everything. So are you ready to do that today? Yes. <laughs> Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. Yes. Tell him you're thankful today. Tell him that he's good. Tell him that he's worthy of praise. All right, stand up and let's read the Bible together. Good, now, now that you're all fired up. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And the scripture, get your hand up high if you need a Bible. And the scripture says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Father, thank you for Jesus, your son, thank you for him, God. Thank you so much. God, our hearts, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving and praise. You have been so good to us. Father, we're a rescued people. We're a delivered people. God, not because of our efforts that we can boast in, but because of your great grace, all because of Jesus. Today, would you give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation? God, help us. Help us to see in a clearer way. God, reveal to us in a new way. God, show us in a deeper sense the power of the work of Christ in our lives, not just to save us to the holy hope of heaven, but God, every good thing right now every good thing right now, this new reality that we live in, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat today. Sometimes when we're talking about monarchies, we're talking about kings, we're talking about kingdoms, we're talking about thrones, we're talking about monarchies. For some of us, and certainly in our culture, you know, we don't live in that framework. And so there is just a disconnect sometimes when we're talking about these things because it's been a long time since we were living in a monarchy. I'm not saying that monarchies don't exist because monarchies still exist today. For the most part, monarchies are ceremonial or, ex or executive. And ceremonial simply means they're just for show. Some monarchies will probably come to your mind when I say that. They're just for show. They exist, um, but they're just a... Uh, you know, kind of a shadow of the former glory that they used to be. Um, some are executive, and that means that the monarchs today, the kings and the queens, they have some delegated responsibilities, um, very particular in a very narrow sense. And so they're still doing things on behalf of the nation. But there are very few monarchies that are absolute. 
And when I say absolute, I'm talking about a king, a potentate, um, who is living in a place where they are ruling absolutely. They are the final word. They have absolute authority over the people that they are governing, people that they would say are in their kingdom. Um, so, for instance, Oman, Brunei, Eswatini, which is a really small African country, Saudi Arabia, just because you wanted to know today, right? You're like, hey, can you give me the list of still absolute monarchies? Well, these are the only ones. Um, Saudi Arabia obviously has a king, and then Vatican City. These are, these are the only remaining absolute monarchies. Oh, and listen, I forgot one. I forgot one. Um, there is a monarchy today that rules not over a little tiny nation, not over a little tiny group of people, but there, there is an absolute monarchy that has a potentate that rules not just over a planet, but over a whole universe. He is, as we know him to be, <laughs> yeah. he is, as we know him to be, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has a throne. He has a throne outside of this universe. He rules and reigns in absolute love and tenderness, gentleness and kindness. He is like no other king. I give you a list of those absolute monarchies today and certainly you could say that there are qualifications, there are characteristics, there are things that identify those, those particular potentates, but our potentate is like no other king. Our king rescues his people. Our king serves his people. Our king makes his people new. Our king forgives his people, strengthens his people. He shares his power and authority with his people so that they can fulfill his mission. Our king is like no other king. Our king is an eternal king. Our king's kingdom, um, the length of time of his kingdom, we're not talking about decades and we're not talking about centuries and we're not even talking about millennia. The longest monarchy ever to exist in the history of our world is 72 years. That was King Louis XIV in France. Our king, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. There is no beginning to his kingdom and there will be no end to his kingdom as well. His kingdom was foretold by prophets. You remember with me that the prophet said that there would be a son who would be given and he would sit on the throne of David, that the government would rest upon his shoulders and his kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. The prophet said through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that our king not only would be a king that would be given, but that he would come being born of a virgin. It was prophesied that our king would, would heal those who were unable to walk. He would cause the blind to see. He would cause the deaf to hear. Um, it was revealed that our king even had the power to heal those who had life-threatening th chronic diseases like leprosy. Our king's kingdom was was prophesied of, it was foretold, the revelation of our king was given to the very day. Daniel chapter 9, there's a prophecy given that, that laid out the very exact day that our king would be declared king over all of Israel and also king over the world. In fact, the prophecy goes something like this, that from the time that the command goes forth, to rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah, the Prince, there will be 69 sevens or 173,880 days. And from the time that command went forth was given to Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem, you count 173,880 days. It takes us to the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, where he is on the top of the Mount of Olives where he is fulfilling another prophecy given by Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where Zechariah said, Behold, Jerusalem, your king, comes riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey. A donkey had been, had been brought that day. There were clothes that were laid on that donkey. There were palm branches that went down the road from the top of the Mount of Olives down the Kidron Valley into the city of Jerusalem because the prophet had declared the very moment of the coming of our king, the day that we celebrate today. This moment on the Mount of Olives, he revealed what kind of king he was. He didn't come to be a brutal dictator. 
He didn't come to institute a philosophy or a religious system. He came to establish himself as the eternal king, like I said, who sits on the throne of heaven, but not only sits on the throne of heaven, he today, brothers and sisters, if you believed in him, sits on the throne of your hearts. Your king came to rescue you. This is how good our king is. Your king came to rescue you and to make your life a song fit for the kingdom of heaven. Like I said, he didn't come this particular day that we're celebrating that we call Palm Palm Sunday. He didn't come riding on a white horse. Interestingly enough, and this is just a a note for another time, he is going to come riding on a white horse. He is going to come. He is going to come in power and authority. There is going to be a double-edged sword that proceeds from his mouth, and he will vanquish all of the armies of the world gathered together at the Valley of Jezreel to fight against him. But in this his first coming, in this his first coming, he was saddled up on the colt, the foal of a donkey. He came in humility. He came to suffer. Interestingly enough, if you were in Jerusalem at the time, and you were looking from like maybe a satellite point of view on the east side of the city, there would have been all of these people gathered together looking forward to this moment when Messiah was going to be revealed, recognizing the fulfillment of Psalm 118 verse 22, this is the day, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord, multitudes gathered, Pharisees and scribes, Jesus and his disciples on the top of the Mount of Olives, coming in humility, coming as a suffering servant. On the other side of the city, on the very same day, Pilate, the governor of Judea, had made his way from his residence in Caesarea by the sea with an entourage of soldiers, and he entered in. Through, through the Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem, riding on a white horse. One in power, supposed power and authority. One the coming of a brutal dictator to subjugate the people of Israel. One a humble servant, the creator of the known universe, willing to suffer. Willing to suffer for you and me so that we could, once we believed in him, say, for by grace we have been saved. By grace you're saved. By grace, you're saved. (laughs) David saved Israel with five stones. Moses saved Israel with his staff when he raised it and parted the Red Sea. Jesus saved Israel with his cross. I mentioned last week that um, it was the love of God. As we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and we see this beautiful work that God has done in our life, we know that God was motivated We know that God was driven. He was compelled by his love. And his love was manifested in two ways. It was manifested in mercy in that God does not give us what we deserve. And it was manifested also in grace in that God gives us what we don't deserve. And he accomplished this. This was accomplished through one and only one means. It was accomplished through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm saying today to you, it is God's pleasure to save you, not by your own efforts, but by the efforts of his son. It is the pleasure of God. God is pleased today to rescue you. God is pleased today to lift you up out of the despair that you're living in. God is pleased today to do a new work in your life. God is pleased today to take you just as you are and to give you what you don't deserve, to give you that rescue, to give you that hope, to give you that new beginning. But you know the truth is this, you have to recognize your own need. You've got to come to a place where you realize that there, that there is a God. That deep down inside, you've known all along. Deep down inside, you've known all along that you were made for something more. The Bible says itself in Ecclesiastes that God has placed heaven within our hearts. You look at the world that you live in, in those moments where you're lucid and you're clear thinking and, you know, you've come to your senses. You know there's an intelligent designer You know that you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. You know there's a sophistication to creation that 
that compels you to believe in something more than, than something like evolution. And because you see this, you see within creation itself the handiwork of God, you know that this life isn't just going to end when you take your last breath. You know deep down inside that, that you're not just going to be annihilated. You're not just going to cease to exist, but someday you're going to stand before your maker. Someday you're going to stand before your maker, and that should compel you to recognize your need. You know, God lays out your responsibility here, and I think it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful section of Scripture. For by grace you've been saved through, through what? through faith. Hey, what is your job? What is your responsibility? Some of you, you know, you want to believe that there's a God. And it's your hope that there is a God. And you want to know what your responsibility is in being able to approach this God. Well, the God of the Bible lays it out. Your responsibility, your job is to believe. Your job is to have faith. And we all put our faith in something. We're all looking to something to deliver us. We're all looking to something to give us strength during times of crisis. We're all looking and hoping in something that just in case there is life after this life is going to see us all the way through. Where's your faith? What have you put your hope in? What are you believing in? Some of you today, you have misplaced faith. You believe in a religious system, a concoction of humanity, some of you today are trusting in your finances or, or your money. You've thought, man, my money's got me this far. It's, it's, it's brought me through all of these life crises. Maybe it will help me in the end. Some of you are looking to your own ability or maybe you have a believing spouse. Some of you have created a philosophical construct and so you've worked your way, as it were, into a mindset, a framework that pacifies your conscience and somehow settles your soul in thinking that after this life, everything is going to be okay. You know, I started that misplaced faith litany with religious system. And I think maybe some of you are like, well, well wait a minute, pastor. Isn't Christianity a religious system? And today I want to say to you, my faith, my faith is not in a religious system. My faith is in a person. And his name is Jesus. <laughs> The scribes and Pharisees were watching what Jesus had done, and he'd done so many mighty miracles. They said to him, hey, what must we do? What must we do to, to work the works of God? And Jesus said this, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. In other words, like don't get all caught up and consumed with those things. Focus on the one thing that matters. And by the way, these aren't my words this is not some religious construct that's been created by Calvary Chapel. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. He goes on to say, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise, what will, what will Jesus do? And I will raise him up on the last day. Hey, listen, these are his words. Man, maybe you've wondered what it was that Jesus taught. Maybe you've wondered what it was that Jesus came for. Maybe you've viewed him as a, as a good teacher, one of the great religious leaders, somebody who uh, lived a life that is worthy for you to emulate. But it's so much more than that. He says, this is the will of my Father. Have you wondered what the will of God is? Have you wondered what it is that, that God wants from you? Well, according to Jesus, he says, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him. The will of God for your life is that you would believe in Jesus. This is the way. This is, I'm not trying to be Mandalorian today. This is the way. <laughs> This is what God has designed. This is, this is the system that God has set up. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift. It's a gift, it's a gift for you to receive. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So Paul says, hey, listen, it's not, it's not a matter of your morality. It's not a matter of your religiosity. It's not a matter of your church attendance. Could you imagine what Sundays would look like? Could you imagine what our Sundays would look like if it was a matter of our own efforts and our own works? I mean, we gather together 
And you know what? We'd be boasting. We'd be taking credit for. We'd be measuring ourselves against one another. We'd be lifting up our own names. We'd be talking about our streaks. You know, hey, we've got this church attendance streak. How many times have you gone consistently? You know, it's be a tough one for some of you. How many times have you gone consistently? We'd be talking about our, our attendance and our sacrifice and our giving and how much we serve and all the missions trips that we go on. And you know what, if, if that was the case, if that was the case, there, the, the thrones in this room, we would be sitting on them and we would be praising our own name. But let me tell you something, that's not the case. What I love about this church is we're a rescued church. We're a saved church. We're a delivered church. We all have stories of the rescue of God in our lives. Right, we, we come into this place and it's like, man, you know, if anything, let me tell you how lost I was and how deep the pit was and how far he had to reach. I'm not boasting in my sin, but let me tell you just how powerful the work of Christ has been in my life. Let me tell you the testimony that he has given me. We gather together because we know that there is one throne. And there is one and only one who sits on the throne. There is one name that's to be praised. There's one name that's to be boasted in. There's one name to be adored. There's only one who's worthy of all of our fervent adulation, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul is talking about this very thing, and he says, but God chose... What is foolish in the world to shame the wise? God chose what is the weak, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose, by the way, this is you and it's me. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is so good. That it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Man, that's good. That is good. That's what we come to do. That's what we come to do. So listen, you can come just as you are. You can come just as you are. You know, some of you, you sit in the seat and you think, man, I'm just so unworthy. I'm so unworthy to be in your presence. And I, I've got this and I've got that and I've done this and I've done that. It's like, yeah, he knows. He knows. He knows. And you know, you come to him with all of that and he embraces you in love. You come with your heroin addiction. You come as a homeschooling mom with your struggle. You come as a sophisticated business owner. You come as an exotic dancer. I'm just saying like the ends of the spectrum today, this is what the church of the living God is about. You come to King Jesus just as you are and you believe in him. Like, I'm, I'm just saying, church, we've got, we've got good news. We've got good news. If this rubs you raw, if this gets under your skin, I say you probably believed in, a, you probably believed in the wrong gospel. Like, if this is offensive to you, the first service didn't get this, so I don't know who this is for. If this is offensive to you, you know, maybe the truth is this. You've been boasting in your own works. You've been boasting in your religiosity. You've been boasting in your own capacity to change yourself. And in that self-exaltation, that sense of self-righteousness, it's become very convenient for you to look down at other people. And so, you know, when I, say, when I say something like, hey, you know, the heroin addict, the homeschooling mom, the sophisticated business owner, the exotic dancer, the, the, the pimp or the prostitute, you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Don't, don't include me in that group. Why not? Like, why not? Like, you really think, you really think because of the, the minuscule morality in your life that somehow you're better than anybody else? We all have a desperate need to be rescued, and there's only one way for that to happen, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. He saves you. <laughs> he saves you. He saves you. Listen, uh, verses 8 and 9, probably some of you have them memorized. You've tucked them away in your heart and they're, they're, it's good that you do because of solid theology and it is your testimony. But don't forget verse 10. Don't forget verse 10 because verse 10 is connected to, you can't separate verse 10 from verses 8 to 9. 
Um, and I have it memorized in the New King James Version. So if I say this and it doesn't line up, that's, that's why. Um, right? So for, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has beforehand prepared for us to walk in. Your king, the king that sits on the throne of your heart, has not only rescued you, but he's rescued you to make your life a song fit for heaven. To make your life a song fit for heaven. Let me say it like this. Jesus didn't only save you so that you could go to heaven. He saved you so that he could, in this life, prepare you for heaven to make your life fit for his kingdom. So our king is a creator. He's a creator. You know, there's a, there's a group of people today that um, really do drive and influence our culture. They're called creatives. Maybe you're, you consider yourself uh, a creative. You know, you just have a capacity, um, either inherently or through spiritual gifting, to create things. And, and so much of our culture today, like I said, is driven by creatives. By the way, you know, you are able to have the capacity to create because the ultimate creative, Jesus is the ultimate creative. He has given you that capacity don't forget that he is the creator. Our king is the creator of all things. Everything that you see, everything in the seen world and the unseen world. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says this, By him all things were made that were made either in heaven or on earth or under the earth. And then John says in John chapter 1, all that was made was made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. That's, that, by the way, is not an easy one to memorize. But John's just like being um, excessive. He wants you to understand the things you see, the things you don't see, the things that take an electron microscope, the things that take the Hubble telescope, the things that you can touch and the things that you can feel and the things that are actually behind the physical veil of reality, the spiritual world, our king is the creator. He has made all things. Um, P.S. He's worthy of worship because of that. All right. P.S. He's worthy of worship because of that. But Jesus isn't like the creator of deism. Deism says that, that the creator created and he wound creation up like a clock and then he has stepped back, ceased his creative works and then lets everything roll out as it were not engaged in the affairs of humanity. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, yes, Jesus is the agent of creation. He made all things, but he still is creating today. He still is creating today. He is like a potter. He is like a poet. He is like a composer. And I say that because the scripture here says we are his workmanship. It's a powerful word in the original language. The word is poema where we get our word poem from, it means masterpiece. You are, you are his masterpiece. You're his masterpiece. He is a, a creator who is still engaged in creating to this very day. He created you physically in the matrix of the womb, in that dark place he was present, ca causing your cells to multiply in an ordered way. Right? Psalm 139, he is the creator who is engaged in the physical creation of every human being. He places a unique personality. He gives a soul. There's a spirit that's given to every one of the, 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 the persons or people that he has created. Not only that, but he recreates. He, you are born physically, and when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you are reborn spiritually. And he is molding, he is making, he is shaping. Before I get to what the word workmanship means, I want you just to notice for a minute, the Bible says we are his. We are his. I just want that to settle in your heart today, that if you put your trust and faith in Jesus, you belong to God you belong to God. There's a really, really old movie called Fiddler on the Roof. And, uh, oh yeah, you like that, Sonia? 
Like it's really old. How many of you guys have seen Fiddler on the Roof? Raise your hand. Okay, well, we're not having a movie night, but I just, I just was curious. You can watch it later. Um, the screenplay was amazing, you know, built for Broadway, story about this Jewish family and this very unique relationship that this man, his name's Tavia, had with God. And it's an ongoing conversation that he has with God. Well, he's got five daughters. And, you know, the time in which he was living, five daughters was really not considered to be much of a blessing because it was an agricultural um, society. And daughters at that point in time weren't able to do as much work as boys were. And so, you know, as we're introduced to the daughters, there's this scene and he's looking at all of his five daughters and he's like, this one's mine and this one's mine and this one's mine and this one's mine and this one's mine. And you can see on his face, there's this love and joy that he has for each of his different daughters. There's an appreciation that he has for each of his girls. They're all different. They're all on their own journey. They all in, in moments are wayward in their relationship with God. They're all unique in the way that they've been created. But there's this, this love, the love of a father for his child. And you can see when he says, this one's mine, there's just this, there's this love and appreciation and adoration. And I say that today to say that the father says the same thing for you. The father today looks at this gathering and he says, this one's mine, and this one's mine, and this one's mine, and this one's mine, and this one's mine. He doesn't say, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't say, yeah, sorry to say, you know, I mean, I kind of wish it wasn't the case and really kind of bummed out about this. And this one's kind of mine or like, we're not really sure yet, you know, we're not, we're not sure how this one's going to work out, so let's just keep going on. Look, I say that um, that way to say to you, if you've believed in Jesus, you belong to God. You belong to God. He takes pleasure in his children. He takes pleasure in his children. In those times where we're walking strong, in those times that we struggle, we're all unique. We're all different. We all are fearfully and wonderfully made. We have personalities handcrafted by God. We all have our unique story. We're all on our unique journey. And he loves us with a relentless love. David called it a steadfast love. That means a love that is pointed in one direction that won't change. You are loved by God. You belong to him. And not only that, but you're his poema. You're his poema. You're his poem. You're his symphony. You're his composition. You're his song. I just want that word song to settle in your mind today because um, this is exactly what the scripture says and the scripture says it in poetic terms. Sometimes our theology, you know, while it's right to have doctrine and theology, it can be so wooden and disconnected from, you know, a, a warm relationship with God. And I think that this portion of scripture just powerfully communicates the warmth of God's love for us. And the depth of his work, you are the song of God. Brothers and sisters, you don't just sing songs to God. You are God's song. You are God's song. You are a new creation in Jesus. You say, you know, pastor, it doesn't really feel like it. You know, it doesn't feel like it. I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't feel like it. And I say to you, you need to lean back on what God says. You are. You are his workmanship. You are his poem. You are his symphony. You are his composition. You are his masterpiece. You are his work of art. You are his song. Look, if you are struggling with any sense of value today, the, look, the choice is yours. The cho I can't sit here and convince you to find your value in God. You have to make that decision for yourself. What I can do is I can point you to the book and I can say, hey, it says it right there. I know you're struggling. I know, I know you battle. I know you have these thoughts that run in your mind. I know that, that you're focused on your weaknesses and inadequacies and all the ways you don't line up. And I know the devil's got a foothold in your life. And I know that you're so depressed about you and your condition that you begin to question if you have any value. But you've got to go back to what he says. You've got to go back to what he says. And he says, you are. Like, it's a settled deal. You are his 
workmanship. You have value in the eyes of God because you've been created by the ultimate creative by Jesus himself. Like an artist, like an artist, he has put all of his creative power and energy and heart into recreating you. He has put all of his creative power, energy, and heart into recreating you. He said, as it were, I'm going to bleed for your splendor. I'm going to recreate you into a masterpiece. You are going to be my crowning achievement. I love the way C.S. Lewis said it. He said, we are a divine work of art. Not because of us, but because of him. Paul says it like this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are living in a new reality. You are living in a new reality and the composition is complete. And and now you have the opportunity to learn to live to it. You know, I was thinking this week about what heaven's going to be like and I was thinking, we all love music, and we listen to music all the time. We've got Apple Music, we've got Spotify, whatever the um, you know, platform you choose is. But I thought, man, what, what's heaven's music going to be like? Like, what are the songs? What are the songs? What's God's playlist? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, he's not going to be using Spotify or <laughs> Apple Music. But what is God's playlist? And I, I started to think, you know, God's playlist, it's not songs, it's people. It's people, it's his redeemed, it's his recreated. He scrolls through the list and he's like, oh, this is, this is a number one hit. By the way, with God, every soul, every saved soul, every redeemed child of God is a number one hit. Everyone. You know, you, screw, you, you scroll through your music and you've got your favorite songs and you, you know, you click the little heart and And then, you know, it puts all the songs together for you, the ones that you love the most. Well, guess what? That's what heaven is. It's all the ones that God loves the most. These are all his favorites. Our King, King Jesus, makes beautiful music. And that is your life. And it's going to be so profound in heaven that the angels themselves are going to be looking at you, wanting to take a deeper look into what God has done in and through you. You say, well, where is that in the Bible? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter's talking about the prophets and how God raised the prophets up to prepare to lay the groundwork for the gospel, the gospel that these believers had received. And he says it like this. He says, it was revealed to them, that is the prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those preached For those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels long to look into. They're going to be astounded in heaven as the whole playlist of human souls is laid out in the celestial city. And they will long to look into the powerful, unique things that God has done in, in your life. And so let me ask you something. Now that you're living in this new reality, now that you are the workmanship, the poem, you are the song of God, are you playing his song? Are you playing his song? Are you playing to the musical score that God has set? God's not just created you with value. God's created you with purpose. And the way that it reads here in Ephesians 2.10 is this, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God beforehand prepared for us to walk in. Which God beforehand prepared for us to walk in. In other words, like the picture is this huge symphony and all of us are, you know, musicians. And Jesus is the conductor. And there's music that's set before us. And every day we have the opportunity to play the notes that he has set before us so that there is a joyful song of praise that rises to him. Every day we have the opportunity to look to the book and to understand the musical score has been set. Like we were playing to a different musical score before. We were playing some old music We were playing in a way that was self-centered and self-absorbed. It was our own music. We were playing to please ourselves. 
And now there's a musical score that's been set before us. And every single day we have the opportunity as we get ourselves in the, in the book, the word of truth, to do those things that make melody in our hearts to the Lord an offering of worship and praise to him. It works like this. When, when the devil tempts you, when you are tempted, you have the opportunity to think, hey, listen, this is not a note I'm going to play for my king. Not a note. When the devil comes and tempts you with gossip or slander or lust or greed or covetousness, when the devil comes and tempts you with self-absorption to, to, to be filled with anger or frustration, you have the opportunity in a moment to say, I'm not playing that note. I'm not playing that note. I'm not going to be out of key any longer. I'm not going to make a note in my life that is not a melody to the Lord. I want to make a beautiful sound to him so I will choose what is true. I'm not going to play the old song. I'm not going to be like Israel looking back to Egypt and saying, hey, we wish we could play the old music that we played when we were in slavery. Like, no, that song is a song that ended and he has a new song for you and for me to play for his glory. What if every day, what if every day we looked at every action, every thought as an opportunity to play a note of worship to our king, a daily song of adoration to him? I was, after the second service um, last week, some of you were like, hey, pastor, you bounced. Where did you go? Well, after the second service, I hightailed it to my car and drove home, and Rachel and I had loaded up Alec and Ari's stuff in a U-Haul, hooked up their car, Alec flew down, and so we drove right after the second service up to Portland, and um, thankfully did not get a ticket, which, you know, I'm super grateful for, but we made it up in record time, about seven, 16 hours, and you guys know, because some of you have said this to him, man, and you've said it to me, Pastor Portland, really? Like, you know, Portland's so messed up. Easy. <laughs> Portland's so messed up. Like, Portland is a total disaster. It is falling apart, you know, from the government to the people. Why in the world? I mean, it is so desperate. It is so spiritually broken. Why would Alec and Ari move to Portland? And I'm like, you just answer your question, yo. <laughs> You're just like, yes. You just, you just answered the question. You just answered the question. As people are moving out of Portland... There are Christians that are moving into Portland. Look, if you were to take the cities in our nation that are the most messed up cities, Portland would be in the top three. I mean, it is a spiritually broken city. It is a place where principalities and powers, dominions, rulers, and authorities are having a heyday. And, you know, we unloaded their stuff and um, they took me to the airport the next day. And I was, went through TSA, and I was like, man, you know, I've only had one flat white this morning. I really want another flat white. And so, so Stump City Coffee was right there in the terminal that I was at. And a beautiful coffee shop, really, really open. And so I walked up, and I always wanted to hit up Stump City anyway. And as I was walking, I heard music. And before I could even make this, the composition out. I didn't, know, I didn't know what the music was. I'd never heard it before. Before I could even really process the music, there was an atmosphere of worship that hit me. I mean, just, an, you know what I'm talking about? An atmosphere. I, already before I even got up there, I'm like, there's something different going down here. I could tell. I could tell it was worship. So I got up, you know, I'm in line and I do what old people do when they don't recognize a, a song. I hit Shazam. Shazam the song. Um, it was Upper Room. And, um, and I just sat there, and it was God's divine timing because God knew I needed this particular song. The very lyrics that were being sung ministered to my heart while I'm waiting for this cup of coffee. And so I give my order to this young African-American girl, colored hair, pierces, and she's pulling my shots and making my coffee, and she's worshiping God. You know, so you've got, she has set up her speaker in Portland Church, in the airport, in the terminal, she has set her speaker up. There's worship that's filling the terminal. And she is, she is pulling my shots and she is worshiping God. And I'm like, I'm like filled with joy, right? We have this nice conversation. And as it ends, God's like, this is my city. That's right. 
This is my city. This is my city where my people, where my people are living a life, their life like a song to me, where my people are living in a way where on the throne of their heart, I am sitting. When my people recognize that, that I have beforehand prepared for them good works, and I'm not talking about good works like, hey, that means you're a pastor or you're a missionary or you're a worship leader. I'm talking about living your life every day as a song to God. Every single note, as you're going about your business, front and center is your life, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one and only one who deserves your worship and adoration and adulation and praise. Like when you live like that, But this is the thing, when you live like that, not only is, is the king on the throne of your heart in heaven blessed, there's an atmosphere. There's an atmosphere that exudes from you. There is an atmosphere that surrounds you because, listen, you bring the, do you know you bring the presence of God into every place you set your foot? Do you know that? You bring the presence of God. You're like, hey, pastor, you know, there's so many people to reach and it's messed up and the strip is this and the strip is that and I can't. It's like, whoa, whoa, stop. You've got the presence of God in your mortal body, right? Some of you, some of you have been walking with God for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You've stopped singing your song. You've stopped singing your song. Like you are going through the motions, you're getting it done, you're biding your time, but, but that you, there was a point in time when, when you were in love, you know what I'm talking about? When you were in love, when you were in love with the Lord, when it was rich and deep and powerful and meaningful and he was touching every single part of your heart, there was the fragrance of love that was flowing out of your life and it's been stopped up. It's been stopped up and you're getting through and it's really tough and you're torqued at the world and you can't believe this, you can't believe that and you're no longer exuding the atmosphere of worship anymore. And this has impacted your family and it's impacted your friends and it's impacted your city and it's impacted your influence for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is God looking for? He's looking for a people that will live their life as a song to him. He's looking for a people that will say, every note I play today, it's for you. For by grace, I've been saved through faith, that not of myself. It's a gift. It's a gift. And so you've earned it, not me. Therefore, I'm your poem. I'm your composition. I'm your song. And I'm going to play your melody. I'm going to play your melody, God, because I want to please you. You are pleased with me because I have faith in your son, but you are also pleased when I live in alignment with your divine purpose and my heart beats for you and for you alone. Look, you want to see your world impacted around you? Start living that reality. When he sits on the throne of your heart and he is the one who receives all of your praise, all of your song, a melody sung to him. 